uh, singer, songwriter, actor and writer Lo Carmen. Welcome to Australian Musician. Thanks, Greg. Hi. Uh, very exciting day today because your book, uh, your memoir, Lovers, Dreamers, Fighters, uh, is out today. Uh, also the name of your 2017 album. Um, yes. The book is a memoir, but uh, it also weaves into it uh, stories of other women who have influenced you, people like Renee Geyer and Chrissy Amphlett, uh, Robin Archer, PF, uh, Too Many to Mention, you'll have to buy the book. Um, was that a concept you'd had in your head for a while? Well, yeah, actually, I kind of think of it more as a cultural history than a memoir, but um, as usual, you know, genres kind of, push you down into one particular tunnel. So that's what it's been sold as, but it's it's definitely more a kind of love letter to all of the musicians and women that have inspired me. Yeah, it's also a unique uh, fly on the wall view of Australian music history because um, you, you were close to people like uh, Vince Lovegrove, the Divinals manager, and you, you witnessed the highs and the lows of that band from sort of within. Um, through your dad, you experienced parts of Robin Archer's life, Wendy Sannington's life. Uh, as a musician, you hung out with and played with um, bands, you know, members of X and the Cruel Sea, the Nick, Nick Cave guys. Um, yeah. Music history was always happening around you. Um, as you were writing... Yeah been quite normal but I kind of realized that it wasn't that normal <laughs> suddenly and thought it's, it seems like it would be a good thing to write about yeah. especially people like Wendy Saddington were starting to disappear from people's memories because she didn't record very much um, and I just thought it was really important to share her story and and who she is because she was so important to Australian music. Um, and I just think it's important to speak about people and remember them. Yeah, uh, it was a real job on the, uh, on the memory bank because uh, a lot of this stuff happened when you were very young as well. Was that difficult uh, remembering a lot of the stuff? I didn't remember much of it. Most of it was uh, found through research, um, through digging through photographs, some kind of notes, but mainly through reading other people's memories and placing myself there as a child, you know, remembering that, oh, yes, I was at that concert or um, a lot of stories from my parents. They've been amazing with what they they've managed to remember yeah um Sally, dad is a far he's got a far better memory than me despite you know being a rock and roller since the age of 13 <laughs> i don't know how he does it yeah you can tell that a lot of research has gone into the book um it's full of a lot of great fun facts um when you're talking about someone like pf or marilyn Monroe or patsy klein uh for example they all died in the same year which i didn't know uh, yeah um, well, that was a fact from A Star Is Torn, Robin Archer's play about um, women in showbiz that had all died tragically, that she wrote as a tribute to them when she realised, like, she just suddenly went, oh, my God, all the singers that I love all died these awful, sad, tragic deaths, and that's why she put this show, A Star Is Torn, together back in 1979. And she ended up touring that around the world. And it was very formative for me because my dad was a musical director on it. So I got to see it maybe a hundred times. And wow. I, just, I might be exaggerating. It certainly felt like at least a hundred times. Yeah. So how important was it to do that deep research for this book? Oh, so important. Um, yeah, I've just spent the last couple of years deep in stacks of research which has been a joy but also a lot of it's kind of hard to corroborate uh, and also because I've never written a book before I didn't know that you meant to keep detailed notes on where you found everything so once we were in the editing stage the editor kept saying and where's where's the fact checking for this one and I basically have to do all of the research all over again to find it <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's quite a <laughs> quite a learning curve, but we got there. Yeah. Um, you've had some significant acting roles uh, in your career, uh, including the My Voice Broke, Nostradamus Kid, and Blue Murder, the TV series. Uh, um, you played Sally Ann Huckstep. Um, and that's covered uh, quite a bit in the book. Uh, are there similarities between acting and singing, learning lines, writing songs? Uh, well, yeah, I guess the learning lines things. Um, I think really it's just trying to bring a story to life as truthfully as you can, whether it's in a song or somebody else's story. I mean, generally... I tend to sing mainly original music, but with covers, that's the same as, as acting. You're, you're singing somebody else's song. You're trying to make it as true as you can. So yeah, I do see a lot of similarities. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the book uh, is the time you were booked and then bumped from the David Letterman show. Um, oh. <laughs> Uh, it turns out they weren't so much interested in your your films or, or your songs, but something else. Are you able to relate that story? <laughs> well, yeah, they. Uh, I had been learning how to do fire breathing from a girlfriend's mum who was in the circus, and I thought I was pretty good at it, but I was pretty terrible at it, and I didn't practice it. And but I had a photo that went in the Daily Telegraph or something like that. And somehow when I went to America to promote the year my voice broke, David Letterman's people had seen this photograph of me breathing fire and they thought that it was kind of my amazing party trick and invited me onto the show to do it and brought me into a boardroom before the show to do like a pre thing and, and show them how great I was at it. But it was a complete disaster and just a tiny little flame came out and they grabbed it off of me and stuck it in the, you know, the fire sand and there was firemen standing there with fire extinguishers and it was all kind of very dramatic and pathetic and <laughs> they bumped me, yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't surprised. I would have bumped me too. It makes for a great story for a book though. <laughs> Um, another part, uh, another favourite part of uh, the book for me was when you're talking about the argument you have with your husband, he laid down a harmonica track uh, on one of your songs uh, and you were really happy with it and he sort of thought it was just a guide track and wanted to get a professional harmonica player in and uh, it, it gave you a bit of grief and then you go on to note all the happy mistakes that happened on records that you enjoy, the, the mistakes that give records character. You, you've never been about shiny new perfection, have you? No, I definitely have not. In fact, um, I always prefer things that are older and, and treasures and that just happen kind of naturally. Um, I love first takes a lot of the time. I mean, that's not to say that I haven't had songs where I've done 20 takes trying to nail something, but I just think there's something really special in capturing the moment. Um, and I love that pretty much across the board. Yeah. I love in people and moments and songs and records. Uh, you're presenting a Wendy Saddington tribute uh, in March for the Sydney Mardi Gras, uh, which I think was supposed to happen last year. Um, mm -hmm. What do you find so fascinating about Wendy Saddington? Uh, I think that she has probably the most beautiful voice I've ever heard. And just the fact that because she didn't record and she's disappeared from recorded history of Australian music, but when she first came out, she was as well known as Billy Thorpe or any of the pioneers of Australian rock. Um, but yes, her lack of recording has meant that she's, she's no longer known. Um, and she just had such a fascinating career because she went from kind of the hard rock music scene in the early 70s playing with Chain to then becoming a kind of underground queer icon, performing with drag queens in Sydney, with Sylvia and the Synthetics. Um, she was very much a, a, a queer idol 
although a lot of rock fans didn't know that she was gay. Um, and I think that's really special and should be celebrated. Yeah. Um, and also just the friendship that she had with my dad and the, the music that they made together was so beautiful and getting to witness that so much was really pretty special for me. Yeah. So who else is, is involved in that show? Well, we've got Harry Bruce, the bass player, who was in Jeff St. John's Copper Wine and a million different bands, played with Rene Geyer a lot. Um, he's going to talk about his memories of Wendy. We've got the legendary rock photographer, Philip Morris, who shot Wendy from late 60s through to late 80s, um, telling us stories behind a lot of his photographs. My dad, Peter Head, talking about their experiences. We've got lots of amazing photographs that have never been seen. And uh, I actually got given Wendy's beautiful tambourine that's got little stuck on stars and jingly bits. And um, we've actually just got that coming back from the Australian Music Vault in Melbourne where it's been on display and we're going to display that. Uh, so it's just a, a celebration. Yeah, sounds great. Um, you were doing old country rock before it became Americana uh, <laughs> in Australia. Uh, you were influenced by people like Patsy Cline and L Loretta Lynn and Dolly Parton. Uh, what is it about the genre and those kind of artists that you enjoy? Honestly, I probably got into it because of the outfits and because uh, I could never really play much more than three chords <laughs> and because I love the story songs, but it's just such an enduring form of music. And I mean, it's the music that everything seems to have emerged out of really. Um, country and soul are so close that you can do a, a cover of a soul song country style and it's going to sound country and a country song soul style and you know they just work together and they're probably both my favorite genres um that and really kind of messed up punk rock stuff from the 70s <laughs> it's a weird combination but that just seems to be what i like yeah. Uh, you worked with David Ferguson, Johnny Cash's engineer, uh, on an EP that you recorded in Nashville. What kind of things do you learn from a guy like that? And were you able to entice any war stories out of him? I actually didn't try. I'm sure I, I'm sure I could have. Um, his studio is full of amazing Johnny Cash memorabilia and tons of signed posters, Chris Christopherson's uh, signature is on the wall. Um, and all of the musicians, all the session guys that he gets in, most of them have played with Johnny Cash or similar kind of stature. Country musicians in America for a long time, they're all just so casual about it. It's like you don't kind of ask for stories. Um, but I guess what I learned from playing with people like that is that you just trust the songs and, and trust your instinct. You know, they're very unpretentious, they're good at what they do and they kind of don't mess around. Like they know when it's right and when it's time to move on. I really like that. Um, you lived in Sydney during a, a great time for rock music with bands like Spy vs Spy and Died Pretty and X and New Christ and an endless array of great bands. The scene... Yeah. Um, deteriorated over the years, first due to poker machines and then the, the lockout laws and now the pandemic. Um, do you still hold hope for the Sydney arts scene to re-emerge? I always hold hope and I think that Sydney's still full of fantastic musicians and a lot of people are always trying their best to resurrect the dying beast that it is, but um, it's pretty tough. Like, Obviously, we're dealing with pandemic like everywhere else in the world. But prior to that, we were just starting to get some small bar type music things going on. Um, but it always seems to have been hard to survive in, in Sydney as a music venue. Uh, I think five have closed down in the last two months. Mm. Yes. 
that's pretty tragic. It's yeah. really heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, you've been writing a lot lately. Uh, you write a monthly blog newsletter called Loose Connections, where you write down your observations and thoughts. Um, does writing come easy to you? Yeah, it does. I've always written. Uh, and I'm just glad that now I've got ways to output that writing. I just always kind of would write little essays for myself. Well, I'd think, oh, maybe I could send this off to a newspaper or something. I just never really knew what to do. But now um, I love my having my sub stack. I put out something generally twice a month on all kinds of subjects, whether it's music or other random delights. Um, and having written a book, I now feel very enthused about writing another one. Um, I feel like I've found another area that I can keep busy in. Yeah. So where are you at with your music? Are you recording? Are you working towards a release? Yes, I'm for a new album, the band and I have been trying to um, get in and record a new album pretty much since I arrived back in Australia in early 2020, but things just keep getting in the way. Uh, but if all goes according to plan, we'll record in April. Yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned coming back to Australia. Uh, also in the book, when you were leaving, it was your, your 50th birthday. It wasn't very joyous, was it? <laughs> It was not. I had a panic attack in the kitchen and uh, a million boxes trying to pack and leave our house with four days' notice. Um, all the flights were, were closing down, leaving America. We'd been living there for seven years. Our kids had just had birthdays. We had to take their presents and just pack them in boxes. They're still in storage. It was pretty insane, but we were grateful to be able to get back home to our families and we've been here ever since um it seems very nice to be back yeah what are you most proud of in your artistic career um i guess just getting things done it's i really like doing things um kind of overseeing projects i've put out eight solo albums um no, seven solo albums and an album with my dad. I just like seeing things through to completion and I'm pretty proud of managing to do that without any record labels or whatnot. I just find a way yeah. where there's, <laughs> there's a way. Okay, so Lovers, Dreamers, Fighters is out now. Uh, Lo Carmen, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Nice to talk.